Sweet. Uh, well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, thanks, Dr. Meekins, for having a platform for us to be able to do this kind of stuff during the quarantine. You know, the, when I first found out, I found out through my friend Devin. And, you know, I've, I've kind of been super excited to kind of watch from the wings ever since. And so now that there was an opening, I said, why not? And why not share some cool work? Um, so this project is a very interesting collaboration between me and uh, what I consider now a, a very close friend of mine, Tomislav Frischik at McGill. Uh, we met at the Boston Conference in AC, the ACS Boston Conference in 2018. Uh, and, you know, ap after a dinner, he was like, you should, you should come up and visit my lab. And I told him, you know, I have, I have my candidacy exam coming up, so I can't. But he, uh, he shot me a couple of emails and we figured out a good time. And so I came up there. And the funniest part of the story is that this was not the intended project, but uh, Tomislav is a very creative individual. And so he has a way of creating unique projects and also persuading people to do those projects. So I'm super thankful for the opportunity to have worked with him. Um, so there are a couple of concepts in this talk that a lot of people aren't super familiar with. And so I wanna kind of set a, a, a introductory baseline to them. And the first one is mechanochemistry. Um, but before I can talk about mechanochemistry, I have to talk about solvent chemistry. And so solvent in chemistry uh, has a lot of very interesting roles. One of which is to promote the interaction of reagents, whether it be through solubilizing them or not solubilizing a certain thing. And this can influence your product distribution via stabilizing different intermediates or transition states. It can also affect your rates of reaction through the same thing. Uh, solvents can also be used to disperse heat. So if you have a reaction that generates heat, having a solvent can kind of spread that out. Or if it's something that needs heat, having a solvent can help even the, the distribution of the heat that you're putting into the reaction. Uh, you can also use solvents to extract or purify your compounds. And so that's why you see them used in the traditional you know, organic workup or for column chromatography and things like growing crystals. Um, but you know, the, the role of solvents in moth chemistry can be a little bit different. And so in, in the area of moths, solvents can be used to serve as guests in the pores of different materials. And I'll talk about a little bit, a little bit more about that later. Uh, you can use them to template different polymorphs and, and I'll define polymorphs as well, but you can also use a solvent to evacuate a solvent from a pore, which I think is kind of interesting kind of a, a push pull give and take type of thing. And solvent does all of these wonderful things, but solvent can also be bad. And so in terms of waste production, solvent is a very large portion of the waste that's generated in all different forms of chemistry, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. And so they, in 2017, the pharmaceutical industry generated 71.1 million kilograms of solvent waste. And of that 1.4 million was released directly to the environment. That 71.1 million kilograms of solvent waste can be equated to 28 Olympic swimming pools worth of waste. And so if you put that into mind, you could go to the Tokyo Summer Olympics and fill a pool for them. And then four years later, wherever it is again, you could continue to fill more and more and more. And that's just from one year of pharmaceutical waste, how many Olympic swimming pools you could fill over the course of the next couple of years. So uh, just, just keep that in mind as we talk about, you know, solvents and the lack thereof. But there's a solution to, you know, a, a problem such as this, and that's mechanochemistry. And so IUPAC defines it as the, a chemical reaction that is induced by the direct absorption of mechanical energy. And so here I have a couple of examples of some uh, traditional reaction pathways, one of which is the conventional hot plate. So you have a beaker on that plate, there's heat that rises from the plate into the flask, but you also lose heat to your surroundings because not everything is directly transferred to the flask. And so that's a very you know, wasteful process. But in the microwave, you generate similar types of energy. There is some kind of heat that is involved and it's all sealed, but you still have to get that energy from the microwave to the solvent and then from the solvent to the reagents. And that can be still a middleman type process. In a mechanochemical reaction, all of the energy that you generate is handed directly to the reagents. There is no middleman. There is no barrier to pass through. It goes straight from the ball bearings or from the setup to the reagents. And that's super beneficial. 
So, and also it's green from an energetic standpoint. And so here we have a, a reaction profile from the oxidation of paratoluidine. And you can see that planetary and vibratory ball milling, which I'll explain in a moment, the differences come in at a lower energetic use than the conventional heating plate or a microwave system for the exact same reaction. And so not only is it saving on waste consumption, but mechanochemistry can also help save on the light bill, which I think is a really nice uh, selling point. So in some of the more dedicated mechanochemical labs, you'll see one of two different types of mills, either a planetary or a mixer mill. Uh, a mixer mill operates as such where you have a, ball, a jar that sits in a clamp and moves in a semicircular oscillatory type motion. Inside of the jar is a ball bearing that bounces and hits the sides of the wall. And then that collision energy is used to perform chemical reactions. Now, the alternative is a planetary ball mill where you have a jar that sits on a sundial and rotates. And as that jar rotates, you have a shearing and banging force of the ball bearings inside. And so these are the two different types of mills that I work with on a daily basis. But the one that I use for all of this chemistry is a mixer mill, so keep that in mind. So this talk is about MOFs, it's about metal organic frameworks. And so to give some people who aren't super familiar with MOFs an idea, let's take it back to when you were like seven or eight and everyone played with Legos. And if you didn't, I'm sorry, your childhood was missing something valuable. <laughs> but uh, Legos were a great playground for creativity. And so you took these little itty bitty pieces that came in all of these different shapes and sizes. And you came along, you put on your imaginary hard hat and you worked as a, a part-time construction worker, and you built something that to you was amazing. And to some of the other kids, they might've got jealous. Um, we as chemists can imagine moths in a similar way where we have a metal ion and an organic linker. And then we come along, put on our lab coat and our protective glass, uh, goggles, and we put them together to make these metal organic frameworks where the metal serves as a node and then the organic linker serves as a bridge between the different nodes. And these can appear in different structural moieties, uh, which can be, become really interesting in terms of what they can do and how they can be used. Uh, and so when we bring all of this together, mechanochemistry and MOFs can really open up some amazing opportunities. Uh, so here I have an example of a copper isonicotinate MOF that's made by mechanochemistry. And as you can see from the crystal structure on the side of the screen right over here, there are actually water molecules that are trapped in the pores of this moth. So this is what I was talking about as solvent serving as guests in pores. Since you're milling a, uh, a hydrated salt, the water doesn't just sit and observe, it actually participates in helping form uh, these templated moths, which is a beautiful thing. You can also do some variations on milling. And one of those is liquid assisted grinding where you add a small amount of a solvent to the reaction mixture and that can influence your chemistry. So here we have uh, an example where you can ball mill this uh, tricarboxylic acid with some rare earth metals. And depending on the solvent that you use, whether it be DMF or water, uh, you can get different structures to occur. Uh, you can either see a three-dimensional structure with the DMF, or you can see a linear structure with water. And then you can also do some mixed metal species where um, you can start with one metal, add in another, and then just mill them together and they'll do some amazing, wonderful things. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about polymorphism because that's going to be a very important topic that runs rampant throughout this talk. Uh, and so polymorphism is actually defined as the ability for a solid material to exist in more than one form. So if we go back to the idea of our Legos, you may have built this house, but if you put these exact same Legos in somebody else's hands, they may be able to build something totally different, but they still use the same pieces that you did. And that's the idea of polymorphism. The perfect example of this in science and in, and in physical and in chemistry itself is carbon. And so carbon can exist either as a diamond or as graphite, and these are the more common forms that we see uh, or that people can, can draw back to pretty easily. And all of this just goes back to the arrangement of the atoms. Uh, and that's the key focal point of polymorphism. 
And so polymorphism also has a phenomenon called vanishing polymorphism. And the prime example of this in the pharmaceutical space is retinavir. And so retinavir, the structure is shown here, it exists in two different forms, form one and form two. Uh, form one was the original isolated crystal structure. It was ready to go out on the market and then another lab tried to reproduce it and they ended up crystallizing form two. Of course, they're the same molecule, so they should in theory behave the same, but form two is actually less biologically active. The reason being is because it curls up on itself to make these beta sheets that don't allow for it to solubilize as easily in the biological system. That's why it's not as active. So you can have different polymorphs that not only look different, but behave different, but are still composed of the same pieces. So, you know, I, I've talked a lot about moths and I've talked a lot about mechanochemistry, but a lot of people are probably wondering where's the mercury and here it is. And so there are, there are mercury moths present in literature. There aren't very many of them because a lot of people aren't super happy about using mercury, but we have to use these heavy metals to be able to understand what their role is in science. We can't be afraid of them just from a safety standpoint because that leaves a whole area of uncharted chemistry. And so the original preparation of a mercury moth took um, mercury acetate and treated it with imidazole in aqueous ammonia to arrive at this moth in a diamondoid topology. And I'll show you that in a three-dimensional structure in a moment. This was actually investigated in a mechanochemical sense by hand grinding. And you arrived at not only the diamondoid, but a mixture of that phase and what they describe in literature as an hexagonal phase. But since this was done by hand, we thought maybe we could reinvestigate the system and see if mechanical ball milling, which is more reproducible than hand milling, would give us a different phase or be able to tease out the hexagonal form. And so here's the crystal structure for the diamondoid. Uh, the mercury atoms are denoted by the purple nodes and then the imidazolates are the blue and uh, gray uh, circular, well not, not circular, but you get the idea, uh, linkers in between. And you can see that this is a three-dimensional structure because you can actually follow from a mercury node down through an imidazole to another mercury. And so when I say three-dimensional, the layers are actually connected to each other. So keep that in mind. Uh, so we decided, okay, well, let's try to ball mill mercury oxide, as we saw in the other paper, and imidazole, see if we could see that same phase. So if we do this completely dry, just toss the two reagents in a jar and mix them together, we don't see that diamondoid phase. We also don't see the starting material of imidazole or mercury oxide. And so all of this is done by powder x-ray diffraction. If we add in a solvent, to perform liquid assisted grinding, which I showed you before, it can have some influences. You see the same thing when we add in DMF. No diamondoid, no starting material. If we add in methanol or acetonitrile or even water, we do not see that original diamondoid phase that was reported from the solution preparation. Even when we perform the solution preparation to their specifications, we do not see their polymorph. And so this really kind of confused us and said, well, well what are we making here? And so through some, uh, some calculations and some computational work that was done by some uh, amazing people in the lab, hats off to uh, Igor and Mihals, who are doing wonderful things right now, uh, we were able to see that we had a totally different phase which we call a square grid phase. And so the square grid phase is two dimensional because as we remember from the diamondoid, you have a mercury node that you can trace through to the different layers. In the diamondoid, we don't, I mean, in the square, we don't have that interpenetration of the layers. There is no connectivity. And so this is a two dimensional instead of a three dimensional framework. Uh, what's even more interesting is that if you take a look at the SEM images, if you make them mechanochemically, again, they're still the same product, but the crystals are so much smaller just because of the mechanical force that's in, in imbued on the system. Whereas in a solution preparation, you get these really nice, clearly defined crystals in the system. Absolutely beautiful. And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was whether there was any type of solvent entrapment between the layers of the 2D framework. 
And so we took to a thermal gravimetric analysis to try to understand whether there was any solvent incorporation. And so as you can see on this curve, we have two major depression points, one from the original starting compound to through a decomposition pathway to mercury oxide, and then the decomposition of mercury oxide to just mercury and oxygen and, gas and water. And so this shows us that there is no solvent incorporation because we would have seen a much more gradual decrease over time, but we don't see that. We just see these very sharp depressions. So let's talk about structure because that's, that's the very interesting thing about moss is that you can get these really interesting units in between you know, your layers or in the, in the different polymorphs. And so one of them, this is the diamondoid phase. I have a, a, a cutout of that full crystal structure. And so I'm gonna rotate this for you so it kind of stands up. And so this is a cutout from the diamondoid. And over here, I have the square grid. And you can obviously see that the two of these are totally different in their geometry around the metal center. And so we evaluated this through a parameter called tau four. And so when a tau, when you computationally model this and you get a tau four value of one, you arrive at a perfect tetrahedral structure. If you get a tau four of zero, you arrive at a square planar structure. The tau four values for the both of these are on semi different sides of the spectrum where the diamondoid arrives at a 0.96, which is almost a perfect tetrahedron, almost ideal in, in fact. And then the square grid arrives at a tau four of 0.6, which aligns more towards the seesaw or sawhorse geometry. So as you can see, the imidazoles are almost flattened out to make wings on the uh, mercury center. And so since we didn't see the diamondoid phase at all in some of the other experiments, we wondered, was it a situation where we were generating it and then it was being reorganized or whether it was a later stage product in the system? And so we sought out to do some variable time milling to see what would happen. And so in the shorter perturbations of milling, we see a very small increase in the formation of the diamondoid and still a very large amount of starting material. And as we slowly increase the amount of time we perform the milling for before we analyze the sample, we see the diamond oil will appear. There's an intermediate phase where there's a mixture of the two. And then we get nothing but the square grid at the 15 minute mark of milling. And so we wonder, could we slow this down even more and really see where the transitionary phase is? And through some technology that was developed and expanded in the Frischick group, we arrived at the concept of accelerated aging. And so this is a schematic of a modified powder X-ray diffraction sample holder. And we have these grooves that are ground out in the sample holder to be able to place solvents. And you can just wrap this thing in saran wrap and it creates a humidified atmosphere inside where your reagents can sit on the sample holder. They can still be observed by powder X-ray diffraction because the saran wrap is clear, but the humid environment promotes the interaction of these reagents without having to disturb them or without destroying the sample. And so what we see over time through this waterfall plot is that there is a very clearly defined transformation from the diamondoid to the square grid. And we've plotted this here on this graph. And you can see that around the 100 minute mark is where the diamondoid stops growing in and is completely converted into the square grid. It's actually really interesting to watch. So I know at this point, if you're, if you're putting the pieces together that I'm laying for you, you're asking, well, why is a two-dimensional framework better than a three-dimensional? Why is this the product that you get preferentially? Because you would think that since the three-dimensional framework has more connections, it should be more stable. Like if you're building a house, the more foundation you lay and the more studs that you put in the home, it should be a lot more sturdy. Well, we have some invisible studs in the home. And we see these in the computationally modeled structure as these CH to mercury interactions. And the distance between these layers is actually a lot closer than we thought. So this is actually an agostic interaction between the layers where the mercury atom is interacting with the CH bond on an imidazole in a layer above or below itself. And we thought this was absolutely insane because this had never been seen before in the moth, where you have these agostic interactions across the layers. 
And so we thought, is this just a fluke or would this happen if we substituted mercury with another metal? And so again, hats off to Mihaus for the work that he did computationally. He was able to take the crystal structure that we had and just substitute computationally all of the mercury centers for cadmium. And what you see here, even though this is absolutely beautiful work, uh, we actually used this as the cover art for uh, the article. Um, you see that there isn't a CH to metal center interaction in the cadmium. It's, an, it's a hydrogen bond network that's built between the CH and the nitrogen in the imidazole in the lower layer. Whereas in the mercury, we do have an overlap between the CH bond and the orbitals of mercury. So when we stop the mill and all of the experiments are done, what have we learned from this experience? Uh, one thing that we've learned is that we have identified a new square grid polymorph of this mercury imidazolate framework, which contains a distorted mercury center and is actually lower in energy than the previously reported diamondoid. We also have an example of a mercury to CH bond interaction, which we are terming as agostic. Also, we have seen that the diamondoid is observed en route to the square grid. So it's more like an intermediate in a way, a persistent intermediate. And we have a very rare case of vanishing polymorphism in a metal containing species. And so with all of this, you know, I'd like to thank the people who helped get the work done. Uh, so here are the pictures of my two groups uh, during that time. So I, I took a trip up to Tomislav's group and I actually kind of fell on them at the perfect time. They were gearing up for their group anniversary. So I got uh, a lot of free wine out of Tomislav that night. But uh, so that's the group uh, from the Frischik lab. And then also my home group, the Hanusa group. Uh, we're all pictured on the right. And so I've, I've had a very wonderful time working with the both of them. Tomislav was extremely hospitable during my time with him. Uh, and, and Dr. Hanusa and my lab back at Vanderbilt have been nothing short of amazing. And so I really wanted to give credit where credit is due to all of them. And so with that, I'd be more than willing to take any questions and I hope everyone enjoyed. Thanks for coming out. All right, that was in fact a fantastic talk. That, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> thank you all right so i'll say to the chat go ahead and get your questions in um you can type them in the chat and uh we'll we'll get everything collected um so i had a couple of questions uh, that i'd like to go ahead and, and start with um so can you predict what form of the polymorph that you think you'll get based on the milling used um i do not believe so and the reason okay. being is because we thought that we would be able to predict getting a diamondoid or whatever that other hexagonal phase was, and we saw something totally different. Okay. Um, a lot of things when it comes to moths, and this is to my understanding, so I was only a metal organic framework chemist for like three and a half months. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So to my understanding of the process, it's more so templated based on the metal that you choose and the linker that you choose. Okay. Those are the main determining factors. And then after that, everything is a secondary effect. The solvent that you use, okay. in the case of milling, the milling that you use. And so given the fact that the two mills that I showed you have different energetic profiles, the mixer mill is a lot more high in energy. It's a direct impact. It's a lot more forceful. Mm -hmm. The planetary can be a little bit more gentle, but you can do different things to make it more energetic. I don't think that you can predict it, but I do think that you should come into it saying, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to get, but I could get something new or I could get something old. Just keep your mind open about it. Okay. And I guess I, to, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'll, I'll follow up. If you use, but between the, the two different types of milling, do you get different products? I mean, I know sometimes you, you may end up with the same thing um, if something's just overwhelmingly the favorable product, but mm -hmm. if, if there's something more like this situation where, you know, it's it's a little more. Um, uh, what's what I'm looking for here? It's it's a little bit more nuanced. Where you know, there, there's a yeah. there's a changeover that can that can occur. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, do you see that in the two different milling techniques? You can. Okay. Um, we didn't use a planetary mill for any of these experiments. I do have a hunch though that if we tried a planetary mill, mm -hmm. uh, we probably would have seen some more intricate interplay between the two polymorphs. Okay. But you can see different reactivity. So uh, I, I actually have some work that was um, cir cir uh, 
centered, excuse me, around the uh, formation of calcium amide salts. And so what we saw in that project is that if you use a planetary mill, you don't have enough energy to make the compound of interest. You end up making this calciate. Mm -hmm. But if you use smaller ball bearings and a larger number of ball bearings, you're able to overcome that energetic limitation of the planetary mill to okay. make the product of interest. So there are a lot of different intricacies that you can do to make mechanochemical milling fit your fancy. Okay. Uh, it, mill is more so just the first line of defense to getting the energetic input that you want mm -hmm. and then change the milling the milling material of the jar that you use um so for all of these experiments we use teflon mm -hmm. to prevent reduction of the mercury salt to yeah. mercury milk. um you can use stainless steel if you're working in conditions that need to be a little bit more harsh okay um you can use different metals as the milling vessel to do some chemistry with those so james mack at cincinnati has actually done some quote mechanocatalysis that that was actually what i was going to ask was if you could do that okay yeah so he's like used copper milling vessels as a copper source in his chemistry and it's the most elegant stuff that's interesting um, so, yeah so like if you have an idea for it odds are you can do it in mechanical chemistry because the field is not young mm -hmm. but it's very, very fresh to a lot of eyes. And yeah. so since people are slowly and surely getting more comfortable with the idea of doing mechanochemistry because they know it's not a destructive force mm -hmm. in total, people are starting to come up with some very, very amazing ideas all over the place. And it's, it's really helping the field just crack wide open. That's really cool. Yeah, that, I, I mean, that, that's a great point because I, I, I mean, I'm familiar with like ball milling, but I had never even considered until you just brought it up using uh, you know, specific materials to actually activate a catalytic effect along with the, mm -hmm. the energetic effects. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, okay. So in the, in the XRD peaks that you showed on, uh, especially on slide 11, where yeah. you kind of had the different solvents, the peaks shifted just a little bit. Um, is there any significance to that or is it just very slight changes in the framework, uh, crystallization? Uh, I think it's more so slight changes in the way that I loaded the sample. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so PXRD is super, super, super specific uh, about like how you load your sample and the crystallinity of the sample, mm -hmm. um, because all of it is based on uh, reflections of the X-ray from the surface. Yeah. And so if you don't have a completely flat surface, you can see some peak <laughs> shifting or some drifting. Okay. Uh, so it may have just been because the sample wasn't completely and totally flattened out. I got you. But the main thing is just the uh, that the peaks show up in the same general vicinity. So mm -hmm. like, as you can see from the sample that is from the solution preparation and then the liquid acoustic grinding from the water, um, they're, they're slightly off, but the peaks are pretty much like right on top of each other. Yeah. So, you know, in like, like in Proton and Amar, a lot of people wouldn't pay that much mind because it's probably, you know, 0.01 ppm and that's just machine drift. Right. And so I think a lot of this is just more so about the sample preparation in the, in the actual uh, apparatus, not so much the sample itself. Okay. Um, so I've got a question here from Chemist Craig. Uh, wants to know, out of curiosity, uh, why why did you use mercury and then uh, choose cadmium as as the replacement uh, uh, atom? So um, so why did we use mercury? Very very hilarious story. And I'm gonna I'm gonna out Tomislav right now. He's probably gonna be ex extremely mad at me. <laughs> uh, so when I went to go visit his group. Uh, I gave a talk about some work I was doing, the stuff I was telling you about uh, when I did some calcium chemistry. And on one of the introductory slides to the project, I was talking about how the formation of this calcium uh, amide salt has previous preparations using mercury as a co-catalyst. Um, and so Tomislav was like, oh, wow. So you're willing to talk about mercury. So that must mean that you're willing to work with it, right? And I fought him tooth and nail for a week. And then next thing you know, he's like, oh, well, all the stuff for the project that you were going to do is going to come kind of late. So if you could just do one or two experiments with this stuff just to kind of get the ball rolling, I'll put somebody else on it. And I said, OK, cool. And I did one <laughs> got overly excited and said, just do one or two more. And then the whole summer was just doing work. Yep. That sounds um, about right. Right. <laughs> uh, so to answer the follow up, the, the reason behind cadmium, 
Um, the, the reasoning behind cadmium is really just a, uh, a more of a size and electron count uh, similarity. And so we wanted to pick a metal that can fit in that, in that slot, but also keep some of the relativistic effects. So mercury has a, has a lot of relativistic effect around it. So you're not gonna find a one for one match, but we wanted to find something that was relatively close. And so cadmium just seemed like the, the, the best, you know, sister atom to it. Okay. Um, another thing is that cadmium does have some experimental understanding to it. And mm -hmm. so people have made cadmium mops before, um, oh, but we okay. thought that this was gonna be a nice little parallel between the two, just to see if we could take a metal that's nearby it and see if it behaves in a similar manner. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess just to, since the, your answer made me think about this, how does, I mean, uh, valency, I, I mean, I'm assuming the valency of your cation, you know, of course, would affect like how many bonds will form in the moth. Um, mm -hmm. But does it have a strong effect on like, like the, these types of interactions that you're describing here between, between the, the metal center and, you know, other bonds so not not the direct linker uh metal bonding but like the the interlayer bonding and things like that yeah. does, does it affect that very strongly um i'm going to be completely transparent with you i don't know okay um so this this agostic interaction that we've seen is one of the first if not the first reported examples of it okay and so that's why like in the intro i told you using some of these heavier metals is important because we don't know what's going to happen when you get later into the periodic table you know, everybody's super fine with using zinc and using copper and using sure. you know, all of these super friendly fun metals that everybody likes, but nobody wants to touch all the stuff that's later on in the table. Yeah. But you yeah. miss out on things like this, you know? And so mm -hmm. this area of like super late transition metal, super heavy transition metal chemistry with the moths is not completely unexplored, but it's not explored enough because people don't want to deal with some of the metals that come with it. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, uh, we got a question here from Show Me the Mank. Great name. Um, <laughs> first, uh, they wanted to say that they they love the the simple in situ technique. And do you think the do you think different solvent vapors would change anything? Um, in this system, I don't think so. Uh, so, given the fact that in the liquid assisted grinding that we perform we didn't see any you know different perturbations in the, the framework that was made i don't think that changing the vapors would be uh influencing effect on what we saw in the in-situ monitoring but there are some situations that that can happen and it really linked into that idea of you know porosity in the moth if you have a moth that has a certain pore size and you age it in, let's say, acetonitrile. Acetonitrile may fit in that pore. If it's a loose fit, it may kind of just sit in there and fall away, and then the pore can collapse. But if you have something that's a better fit, like DMF, DMF will sit in that pore, it'll template that pore, and it will you know, lock it into that conformation, into that polymorph. Okay. So in our case, not really, because it's the two-dimensional framework, so there is no templatation of pores or structure. Mm -hmm. But in some other situations, I could guarantee you it would probably see some type of difference in the aging experiment. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, and here's a, here's a pleasant surprise. Uh, Tomislav is actually here. <laughs> he says, thanks, Isaiah. That's the whole truth, and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Love, man, I owe you so much and more, dude. You've been amazing. I appreciate you. That's awesome. Uh, all right, we have another question from Chemist Craig. Um, he wants to follow up on the mercury and cadmium question um, and says that you should totally use all the other metals to see which give those cool agostic interactions and those that don't. Um, as for relativistic effects, maybe gold. Hmm. You know, I never really thought too much about gold. Um, and I don't really know why. And I think it's probably because Thomas Love had me beating Mercury so much that I didn't want to think about anything else that would give him a whole new project. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that gold would be a very interesting idea. And I don't really know too much about moth chemistry to say whether there is our gold moths or not. But I feel like it'd be interesting to take a look at. So maybe I'll shoot Thomas Love an email tomorrow and see what he thinks. I was about to say, I mean, you've got, like, you can have gold three. For sure. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, yeah, I bet you can make it work. 
So yeah, actually, I'd, well, I'd, I'd, if you could find uh, uh, a thial, like a, a die thial, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that We're would probably, yeah, that would probably do it. That's a that's an idea. Right. I might have to pocket that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Feel free. Yeah, look, look. I'm I'm a chemical engineer. I'm a god awful chemist. So <laughs> take it, make it happen, <laughs> and just let me know when you publish the paper. <laughs> I, got, I got you. But that's that's the thing is that with ball milling, anybody can get involved at any stage. That's true. So for our group back at Bandy, um, we got started with ball milling when our advisor met Tomislav at a conference. And uh, okay. one of the grad students in the lab, Nick Reitmeyer, he went back to the lab. He went to a hardware store, picked up some ball bearings. He put them in a flask on a rotovap and just slow turned them oh. and was able to make some metal complexes just that way. So you can get involved at literally any stage. You could use a mortar and pestle. You could use ball bearings in a flask. Just don't turn it too fast. Sure. Um, or you could go out and buy a mill. And then the really beautiful thing is, is that pharmaceutical companies do use ball mills but they use them for you know, breaking down of materials or for polymorphism in their own species. And so their mills are actually very well kept. So you could probably buy a used mill from some pharma company mm. for little to nothing, and then just go ahead and get your start there. So there's a, there's a million and one ways to get started and get involved. You just kind of have to find your own area of interest in mechanochemistry and then just take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, so Tomislav wants to say uh, that, that you know, love you, Isaiah. Congrats on a great presentation. We need more dynamic and cool researchers like you. I agree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this was very cool. Uh, we got some fans of industrial ph pharmaceutical milling as well. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll ask one more question and. and chat. Please keep the questions coming if you got them. Um, have you, are you aware of any work? Speaking of you know, sort of uh, materials that people don't really like to work with much. Um, are you are there are you aware of any work on things like uh, you know uranium, thorium, any any of these the radioactive materials? Not in my immediate. <laughs> um, so our group uh, at Vanderbilt, we work with you know main group metals and lanthanides. Okay. And so we've done some stuff with them. I don't think we've done any of the lanthanides yet through any milling processes, but we've done some work with them. But there are plenty of other groups who are working with some of the more obscure things. I just don't, I personally do not know, and this is probably my own fault for not reading as much as I should. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um, I personally don't know if there's been any work in the uranium or thorium space through me mechanochemistry. Okay. All right. I was just curious because, because you know, like I said, you, you had made a good point about how little we really know about mercury mm -hmm. because it, you know, most people go, yeah, it's toxic. I don't want to mess with that. So that's a, I was just curious. Um, okay. So we've got some, uh, gaming phenom wants to know at what point did you realize that the accelerated aging method would be viable in reproducing the effects in an observable, observable manner for this interaction? Got you. Uh, first of all, shout out to GP. That's my boy from high school. We, we've been riding since the wheels fell off. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that he was able to come out. Um, so to answer his question about when we really thought that, uh, you know, accelerated aging would be the trick, it, uh, where is that slide? Uh, it should be this one, yeah. Um, it really came from when we did some of the shortened milling experiments mm -hmm. and we weren't able to see a clean divide between where one started and where one stopped. And so Tomislav's group has done some really interesting work in the area of accelerated aging. So this is kind of like their everyday toolkit. And, you know, when I showed him the shortened milling experiments and I said, I don't know where one stops and where it begins, I just kind of see the middle point. He said, let's age it. And then that's where Igor, um, who has recently graduated from the group and is doing some really awesome stuff on his own. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, how about we do an accelerated aging experiment in the PXRD? And so all of this data is, is, is obtained live. Yeah. Like you do a very short mixing experiment to just get all the materials together. You put them on a PXRD sample holder. You load the groove with water for this case, mm -hmm. peel it up, put it on the PXRD, and then just let it go for hours. And it will run a full PXRD scan and then start over and then keep running them over this time period to watch the sample actually change. Yeah. And for some of the more complex systems, it's a really, really good tool to kind of tease out 
where your active and immediates are, where one process starts and where one stops. And so it was just a no brainer that we would just go ahead and just launch into this process after we saw that we weren't getting a clear line from the uh, short and milling experience. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the accelerated aging was just like that. That's a really cool way to do it. That's, that's a new one on me. So <clears throat> like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really cool. Uh, okay. Let's see. Chemist Craig has, uh, wants to know uh, what, if any, are the applications you see for these frameworks? Uh, it says the agostic interactions make him think of bond activation and, and catalysis. Right. Um, for these exact frameworks, I do not see any immediate use for them. And I'm going to point out exactly why. It's okay. probably really obvious. It's this guy right here. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people are not going to want to do catalysis or, or advanced uh, or, or subsequent chemistry with a mercury framework. If we were able to replace that node with mm. a different metal, then yeah, we could probably do some advanced chemistry with these. There are different frameworks that people have made to do in poor catalysis. Mm -hmm. um, there are frameworks that people have used to work as drug delivery systems. There are frameworks that people have used for water purification systems. And so MOFs have a very, very wide purview for what they can do and how they can do it. Um, but for this particular species, it's kind of, it was more just an exploratory process to see what happens when you take a metal that nobody talks about and you just shove it in there. Sure. But, um, for, for actual application of this material, it, it, it's really just more of a, a museum piece. Okay. So could, could you, could you do something like this as a, as a cleanup, uh, technique? Like, like, let's say there was a mercury spill or something like that. Assuming you could, let's, let's say you could like, you know, I don't know, it's in the ground and you can pull the dirt out and put it into, you know, an industrial equivalent of a ball mill. Could you add a linker material, basically have it react with the mercury and then separate it out? Um, if you added some kind of oxidant to bring it from elemental mercury upwards, or if it is already in a ionic form, then potentially yes. Okay. Uh, Going from mercury zero to mercury two, I don't think it's a very hard process. I think nature does it already for us. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get, you know, uh, alkyl mercuries in certain pond waters, or that's mm -hmm. why they have high mercury contents in fish from certain areas. Okay. Um, so being able to take that mercury and treat it with an organic linker to maybe just sop it up into a moth could be possible. Okay. Uh, I just don't know what that process would look like, you know, separating the mercury from the sure the rest of like the soil or the water or whatever you know there are other purification treatments to remove heavy metals from mm -hmm. from the environment already so being able to put it into a moth would be cool but you would have to have a use for that moth or else nobody's going to want to do it <laughs> true <laughs> true <laughs> that's a very good point um so let's see so gaming phenom wanted to know in finding that divide are you able to find a way to manipulate the return on the polygraph polymorph shapes and reproduce them or is it sporadic Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think all of that plays on equilibria. And so for the for the system at hand, we see that the uh, square grid is the more energetic in nature, mm -hmm. uh, more, more stable in nature, excuse me. And so um, once you cross that line and get into the square grid, we don't really see a return process. Okay. Um, it's more of a once you get the diamond door, you're able to push it over the ledge into the square grid. Now, the good thing about having that line and knowing where that line is, is that if somebody was interested in the diamond door, we know that we could tell them, set up this aging experiment, stop it at 75 minutes. You'll have nothing but diamond door. Or set yeah. up this aging experiment, let it go for you know three hours, and you'll get nothing but square. So it gives you an idea of where to stop or when to go but I don't really see any reversibility in these, in these frameworks. There are probably others that have some kind of, you know, breakdown and rebuild process that's a little bit easier to understand. Mm -hmm. But for these, it kind of just seems like it's a switch where in the off position, you're in the diamond door and then you flip the switch and it goes to the square grid. And then somebody was flicking the switch with their sticky fingers and then it dried and now you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. That's very cool. 
All right, uh, Chemist Craig still still here, uh, pushing hard for the gold. He says he wants you to replace the mercury with gold. Boom, you're done. Although he okay. per- apparently he personally fancies iron for catalysis, so that that might be another option for you. It it could be, you know, like there like the the wonderful thing about moths is that there are so many different combinations that if you could think of a metal and a linker and just toss them in there, you could probably see something amazing. So I, I say go for it. You know, moth chemistry is a very open experience. And, you know, for me coming into Thomas Law's group, I had never done any moth chemistry in my life. And they made it a very palatable experience. Um, learning about moths, understanding moths, and understanding the process behind making them. Um, so if I'm able to do it, I think that a lot of people will be able to as well. So just give it a shot, you know, read some, read some papers. Um, Omar Far- Farha is a really good person to look at for moth stuff. Omar Yahi, uh, Thomas Lobs group as well. And then there are some other people in the mechanochemical space who do some moth stuff. Just take a look around and, and see. And, you, and you'll see that like everybody has their own idea for how to make moths and what should be in a moth. Yeah. And so your idea probably isn't that far off. Okay. Anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, I had, okay. I had one more question for you, and uh, I'll go ahead and say, chat. Go ahead and you know anybody in the chat that has any further questions, go ahead and keep them coming. Um, do do these do the metal centers retain a lot of reactivity after the moth is formed, or do or does it effectively? It, you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure there's some variation depending on exactly what metal you're working with, but in general, mm-hmm. do they do they sort of lose their reactivity, or do they? Do certain ones retain it and other ones, you know, never do or that kind of thing? I think it really gets down to the different polymorphs. And so if you still have an open site on a metal center, then I think it still retains that reactivity, which is why some of the moths that are used for catalytic transformations, it is purposefully designed, or at least the linker is selectively chosen to allow for a metal site to still be available. Um... You see this a lot when people design solution-based catalysts is that they design a catalyst where the ligand will template a slot literally made for that reagent to come in, do its chemistry and get right back out. Okay. And so the same thing works in, in moth chemistry to my understanding is yeah. that you choose the linker that will set your metal center up to at least keep an open site available. And then once you have that site open, then you just go ahead and you do your catalysis with it and it spits out what you want and then you're super happy about it. Makes sense. That's, yeah, that, that's a really cool thing. Uh, let's see if there's, well, I'll give a couple more, a little, little bit more time for anybody that wants to add any questions in, from chat. Um, yeah, this, this was a fascinating talk. I mean, that, this is like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, but it looks like I think I think that might be all the questions from chat. Um, so I will go ahead and say thank you to Isaiah uh, again. Just a really excellent talk, very entertaining and very informative as well. Uh, it's a really cool project. Uh, Thomas Lov, <laughs> thank you for uh, <laughs> for making it happen, uh, and thank you to Isaiah for for doing the work on it. Um, this this was really cool. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight uh, and asking a lot of great questions. And um, I think that's going to be all for today. So I'll say thank you again to Isaiah one more time. Um, and if I can get you to hang around for just a second, um, we will, uh, we'll will chat real quick. Uh, again, thanks to everybody who came out. Um, and you know, again, for for those who may have missed it at the beginning, I just dropped a link to the Discord in the chat. Um, please feel free to join. Uh, it is a uh, supportive environment. Um, we have you know a, a channel for collaboration setups, uh, channel for manuscript helps, things like that. Uh, it's also just a good place to you know relax if you want to share articles and uh, talk about it and that kind of thing. Um, it's a lot of fun to do that as well. Um, and I think that's going to be it for tonight. Uh, next week we have uh, Dr. Damalola Daramola from Ohio University. He's going to be talking about electrochemical wastewater remediation. Um, should also be very cool. So uh, I hope if you were here tonight, you will come out again next week. Um, and I think with that, I will say 
Uh, thank you to everyone, and uh, I hope you have a great weekend, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Have All right, a good night, everybody. Stay safe. Wear your mask. That's right. Yeah, please, please, please wear your mask. I'm so, I, I, want, I want to go back outside again. Please. <laughs> have a great weekend, everybody.